Welcome to the first uh, Functional Medicine Grand Rounds at Cleveland Clinic. I'm really pleased to have you all here. I'm really thrilled to introduce as the inaugural Grand Rounds, Dr. Dale Bredesen from the Buck Institute on Aging. Uh, Dr. Bredesen is really a pioneer in Alzheimer's research. He uh, graduated from Caltech, um, went to um, medical school at Duke, and did his residency at UCSF, a neurology or his chief resident, uh, went to work at the uh, lab of Stanley Persinu, who's a Nobel Prize winner, and, uh, and then was at UCLA for about a decade, and, and now is the CEO and president of the Buck Institute on Aging, and also uh, works at UCLA uh, as the director of the Easton Center for Alzheimer's Disease Research. So he's a pioneer in thinking about Alzheimer's uh, from the perspective of cause. In the past, I think most of us have um, been thinking about Alzheimer's as a fixed disorder uh, based on pathology. Uh, Dr. Bredesen has really been looking at cause and etiology. I think uh, there was an article in JAMA a number of years ago called Shifting Thinking in Dementia about our problem of categorical misclassification and etiologic imprecision, meaning we focus on the categorization by symptoms and pathology, not by causes and mechanisms. And Dr. Bredesen has been focused for the last decade on and beyond on, on causes and mechanisms around Alzheimer's, which gives him a unique insight. And he just shared with me that his entry into this field of, of looking at the brain uh, through the lens of functional medicine has been uh, really out of his own personal story of his daughter having uh, lupus and struggling with this for years and finding um, solutions through functional medicine. And, and uh, now she's fine after, after many years. So I think there's really sort of an intersection of functional medicine science uh, and looking at the body as a system, a dynamic system, and the work that Dale has done around Alzheimer's. So it's really a beautiful intersection. And I'm really thrilled to have him here. And uh, thank you, Dale, for coming. And you're, you're going to hopefully have your minds blown. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mark. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, and I appreciate uh, Mark and, and Patrick and the Cleveland Clinic having me here. This is a tremendous honor. And uh, as, as someone who was born in Cleveland, uh, I'm, I'm uh, really proud of the, what the Cleveland Clinic is doing. The Cleveland Clinic is the first uh, to the first major center to have functional medicine as a center, as a central focus, and I think this is a really exciting time. So I want to congratulate the Cleveland Clinic. Um, you are the first to embrace the visionary medicine, the 21st century medicine that is functional medicine. And this is a site where the best of the new physicians will take major steps forward in treating cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, metabolic disease, hypertension, obesity, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Lewy body dementia, and improve the aging process. So this is a very, very exciting time, and you're the first to be doing this, so congratulations. Very, very exciting. And I want to take a moment uh, to recognize uh, Mark for his uh, very exciting book that came out in 2007, so we're almost a decade ago. And as I'll show you, we came to this question about Alzheimer's from a completely different point, from very basic research over 25 years, looking at what actually drives the degenerative process. And as I'll show you over the next few minutes, what we ended up with was very much related to a functional medicine model and very much validated many of the things that Mark said almost a decade ago. So if, if one, of the, one of the famous quotes from Sir Isaac Newton is that he said to people, I was finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. And the great ocean of truth about the innumerable complexities of the human organism and its diseases still lies before us. There are so many things that we do not know about these incredibly, incredibly complex beings that we all study and try to help. And uh, the 21st century medicine is really the most powerful ship we have to sail that sea. It, this, is the, this is the medicine of the 21st century. Very, very exciting. Functional medicine is the future. And it's interesting to me, functional medicine, um, as you know, really began about 25 years ago with people like Jeffrey Bland and, and his wife Susan Bland, uh, David Jones, uh, and of course uh, Dean Ornish had been doing work on cardiovascular disease and more recently on cancer um, that is a very, a very relevant for this area. Um, and interesting to me as a scientist, what's interesting to me is that functional medicine is really based on a single word, which is why. And it's a word that as a scientist, um, I'm excited by because one of the concerns I always had about clinical medicine was we, we tell people what they have. You have congestive heart failure, you have Alzheimer's disease. And my argument is, 
and as I'll show you over the next few minutes, we shouldn't ever put a period after Alzheimer's disease. We should be saying Alzheimer's disease due to what? What caused this? What are, what are all the contributors to it? And what can we do about it? And if you look at really what we all face as practitioners, it is the mismatch between the tremendous organismal complexity and the practitioner's data set. It's been unavoidably massive for millennia. So we're looking at people who have 3.3 billion base pairs in their genome, and that's the simple part. Now, looking at the proteome, much more complex. Looking at the epigenome, much more complex. And yet, what do we know about them? We know their sodium, their potassium, things like this. So we're really missing a tremendous amount of data. And so we as physicians have had to be uh, guessers, really. We've, we've had to be intuitive. We've had to look at what's likely without really knowing nearly enough data about what's actually going on with the organism. Now, what's exciting about the 21st century and 21st century medicine is that the tools to bring these two, the complexity of the organism versus the complexity of our data set, to start to bring them in line, the tools are appearing. Clinical genome sequencing, so it's relatively becoming more routine now where you can actually get a person's genome without too much difficulty. Pathway analysis, um, imaging volumetrics. Just a few years ago, and still in many sites, you get an MRI and say, well, you know, this person has Alzheimer's disease, I believe. The MRI looks, you know, fairly normal. Maybe there's a little atrophy. The radiologist doesn't often want to call it. If you look at volumetrics, you can say, oh, yeah, your hippocampal volume is at the 17th percentile, your temporal lobe is at the 22nd percentile, et cetera. This is changing the way we understand the patient, and it's changing the way we can follow up on the patients. And then neural exosomes, another good example, where for the first time, and this is work of Ed Getzel and his colleagues and others, for the first time now, we can take a blood test and tell you the chemistry that's happening in your brain. That has not been available before. So now we can say, you actually have insulin resistance going on in your neurons. You actually have a reduction in NGF signaling. You actually have an increase in phosphotau, or A-beta-42, through a blood test. And in fact, if you look at one cc of blood, there are about 1.2 billion exosomes, and about 10% of those actually are derived from neurons. So you have a, a beautiful view into brain chemistry that was not available before. And then, of course, online cognitive assessments. You don't have to go in anymore for a four-hour test, um, which causes stress and, in fact, can enhance the, the underlying problem. Um, now you've got online assessments that can be done much more quickly. And then detailed computational algorithms. Uh, as Mark has pointed out, um, we don't use computers enough in our analysis of patients. And I think this is going to change over time. In so many other fields, this is a very routine thing to do. So 21st century medicine allows us, for the first time, to ask why instead of just what, and direct our programs of therapy to the causes rather than the effects of the complex chronic illnesses that represent the most important healthcare problem today. And this is what functional medicine is all about. So I want to spend the next few minutes talking to you about Alzheimer's disease, why we're attacking it the way we are, and the results we've had, and where we're going with this. And it's interesting to me that the number that's always thrown out about Alzheimer's disease is that there are 5.2 million Americans who have this disease. So it's a very common disease. But in fact, that is a dramatic underestimate. And here's why. Most of the people who are going to get it are too young to know that they're going to get it yet. So the number that you really want to know is, out of the 318 million current Americans living, how many of these people will get Alzheimer's disease during their lifetimes? And the answer is about 45 million of us. So this is a tremendous number. It's about 15% of the population. And as has been pointed out recently, this has now become the third leading cause of death after cardiovascular disease and cancer. And this, of course, led President Obama back in 2011 to sign into law the National Alzheimer's Project Act. And we had our first meeting in 2012 and talked about what can we do about this. So there now is a national plan for Alzheimer's. Unfortunately, it doesn't include a, a, it doesn't include a treatment that works yet. So the key that for all of us is to understand this disease at a fundamental enough level that we can actually fashion treatments that work. <laughs> If you look out to 2050, major problems, this is a global number, uh, but if you look out there, um, you know, Medicare will be bankrupt by this time. So this is a major, major problem. 
On the other hand, if you ask what's actually available to us to, to, to help this illness, the answer is we really have no cures right now. On the other hand, as I'll show you, we actually have a lot more arrows in the quiver than most people realize. There's a lot more that can be done. And unfortunately, women are at the epicenter of this epidemic, and they represent 65% of the patients, they represent 60% of the caregivers, and if you are a woman, your chance of getting Alzheimer's disease during your lifetime is now actually greater than your chance of getting breast cancer during your lifetime. So this is a major problem. And on the other hand, if you ask, what, are th what is the standard of care currently? It, it really is a sad state of affairs right now because patients, as you know, often do not seek medical care because they've been told there's nothing that can be done. They fear loss of their driver's license, the stigma of a diagnosis, the inability to obtain long-term care, and ultimately nursing home placement. So therefore, what do they do? They wait until very late in the process, which is just the opposite of what we need. We need people, we need to convince people to come in at the first symptoms, or preferably prior to symptoms, and get on a prevention program. On the other hand, when they finally do come in, they go to their primary care provider, and the primary care provider says, I know that the neurologist can't really help you. They can write a prescription for Aricept. Hey, I can write a prescription for Aricept. Uh, the primary care provider will say, and so they often do that, and therefore the patients don't really know that they have Alzheimer's disease. They start taking Aricept for many different reasons, and often there's no firm diagnosis. And then at some point, finally, they may be sent to a specialist, often later in the course, and the specialist will say, well, you know, we're going to take away your driver's license, we're going to do some expensive imaging, we, we would like you to come back every six months and get another spinal tap so I can get a grant. Um, and this is a really tough situation. Um, so yes, the research is wonderful, we're, we're understanding the disease better, but we really don't have a lot to offer. So it's really a sad state of affairs. And functional medicine is perfectly in line to change that in a very fundamental way. So if we look at the therapeutic landscape, you see a couple things immediately. So here's what's in phase one, phase two, phase three. And what you see immediately is that number one, you, there are only a couple of different targets that are actually being used. So each different color here represents a different type of drug. And there aren't too many different ones as you can see here. The second thing you see is really surprising. Every single one of these is a monotherapy. So despite what we learned from HIV, where it took three drugs to do really well, and despite what we've learned from cancer, where polypharmacy is a, the standard since the 1960s, every one of these trials is a monotherapy. Does that really make sense for a complex illness? Let's imagine for a moment that Alzheimer's disease is more complicated than HIV, which it is. Maybe it's going to take more than three. Maybe it's going to take five, 10, 15. We don't know. And so we don't have a good way set up currently to approve such combinations. And if you look at what's already been approved, you'll see that all these ones that disappeared are already ones that have already failed in trials. Here are the ones that are approved only represent two different classes, this green and the blue here. And in fact, they don't work very well, as you know. So it's a really tough time. And if you look here, just in the last few years, 244 clinical trials, 243 failed outright. And the one that, quote, succeeded has a minimal effect. And here, for example, semigasostat, over $500 million was spent on developing this. Not only does it not make Alzheimer's better, it turned out it actually makes it worse. So when we have results like that, it's telling us something is fundamentally wrong. We need to reconsider our understanding of this illness. You look here at Dimabon here, first trial was done, failed. Another trial was done just to make sure, yes, it failed again. So this is a really tough time. Now, what would it take for a perfect Alzheimer's drug? If we had anything you could, that you'd like, the perfect Alzheimer's drug, here's what it would do. So this is what you want in your Alzheimer's drug. You want it to reduce APP beta cleavage, reduce the gamma cleavage, increase the alpha cleavage of APP, reduce caspase 6 cleavage, reduce caspase 3 cleavage, prevent oligomerization of A-beta, and so forth, and so on, and so forth, and so on, and so forth, and so on. Now, this is functional medicine. This is, you know, this is one patient on Mark Hyman's morning consult. You know, he's got people who've got you know, bowel issues and skin issues and brain issues and all this. So this is something that functional medicine deals with on a daily basis. But when we go to screen for drugs, it's very difficult to get a drug that does all these things. 
So we need to look at how can we achieve all of these with everything we've got, drugs and, and, and non-pharmacy as well. So over the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about how one goes about developing an effective treatment for an incurable illness. And the, the, the laboratory research goal here, we set up the lab now 27 years ago, uh, right after I had finished my fellowship with Dr. Prusner, uh, and the whole idea was to understand the neurodegenerative process in a fundamental enough detail to design the first effective therapeutics. The idea was maybe we don't understand these diseases well enough, and maybe that's why we're failing. So let's see if we can actually understand these diseases well enough that we can fashion an effective therapy. So I want to leap forward now and show you from the last few years, I want to show you the results first, and then I want to go back and show you how we achieved them and how we got to where we, we are and why we're doing what we're doing. So this is a 67-year-old woman with a two-year history of progressive cognitive decline and very typical story. Uh, came to me back in 2012. Uh, and in 2011, actually, we had been turned down for the, the first... Uh, the, the, it was the first comprehensive trial for uh, early Alzheimer's and pre-Alzheimer's, so-called MCI, or mild cognitive impairment. And we were to do a trial in Australia, along with a drug that we had discovered in the lab. And what they said was, you know, there are too many variables. You're doing all these different things that are functional medicine sorts of things, and you must not understand what a clinical trial is all about. Because in clinical trials, we just change one variable. And we said, well, you guys must not understand Alzheimer's disease because it's not a one-variable disease. So now the trial actually is ongoing as a single drug trial, which, again, we don't believe is the way to go. So shortly after that, I got a phone call. This is a woman who is on the East Coast. Uh, and she uh, called her friend out in San Francisco. Um, her mother had died with Alzheimer's disease and it started when she was 62. This woman had very typical symptoms. She was unable to navigate on the freeway and certainly spatial memory is one that uh, is affected in many people. She couldn't remember what she had read. She prepares very complex reports for the U.S. government. She was unable to prepare her reports. She was unable to recall even four-digit numbers um, her retinal scan was positive for amyloid, and in fact there was a positive control that was in a patient who had familial Alzheimer's disease due to a London mutation of APP, and this person actually had more than that particular patient. Um, and so uh, I talked to her, spent uh, two and a half hours going through what we were doing because I got a call. This woman went into her physician. The physician wrote in the chart memory problems, and therefore when she went to get long-term care, she was turned down because of that note in the chart. So she called her friend and said, I'm going to commit suicide because I watched what happened to my mother and I'm not going to have that happen to me. And so her friend said, well, why don't you come out to the Buck Institute because I hear they're doing something a little bit different. We went through all the different things. I said, look, I haven't seen patients in 20 years. I've been in the lab, but you know, here are the things that we're doing. You can take this back to your doctor, uh, which she did. And I got a call from her in my home on a Saturday, three months later. She said, I can't believe it. My memory's better than since I was in my 30s. And she's now four years into this, doing absolutely great. Still at work full time. She's 71 years old. Um, and I asked her if I could take a little movie of her when she came back. And you'll see everyone here is pixelated uh, or shadowed because uh, they're back at work and doing well. And she said, uh, please don't use my name, uh, so I will not use her name. So tell me a little bit about how things were a year ago. Problems. Well, there. a year ago, I was having a lot of difficulty. I was very frustrated because my memory was poor. Um, I had issues of being spatially disoriented, particularly when I was driving. I would get off the freeway at the wrong exit or not know where I was getting back on, on familiar routes. Um, I would reach in my house for a light switch. I'd reach on the wrong wall, even though I'd always had the light switch has always been on, on the right side. I'd start reaching to the left. Um, I'd call my animals uh, a different name, uh, my pets, and I was really worried about it. I was very stressed about it. Um, so it was a it was a very stressful time. And how are things at work? I have a, a job that requires a lot of mental uh, analysis, a lot of thinking. I, you know, I do a lot of research. I have to collect data, and design the study, and then do the analysis and write a report, usually under pressure. And I was finding that I just couldn't complete an assignment. I couldn't think about the analysis. Um, it was just a jumble to me, and I would start procrastinating and putting it off. And the longer I put it off, the more stress I felt. 
So I was worried that I was not going to be able to continue with my career. And tell me a little bit about how things are now. Things are much improved now. Uh, my memory is much better. In fact, I would even go so far as to say I don't think that I have a problem uh, with memory now, uh, which is a great surprise to me from where I was a year ago. When my thinking, uh, cognitive ability, ability to do work, ability to do reports, um, I am back into the stream of things, being productive and being able to do my analysis and writing, which is fantastic. And how's the driving? Driving, no problem. I drive at night, I drive in the daytime, um, I know where to get off, where to get on. Um, I'm uh, on, the, on the highway, so I'm, um, I feel like that's a problem. I'm not reaching for the wrong side of the room for the light switch. I'm not calling my pets the wrong name, which I think they're probably grateful for. And how overall are you feeling? I feel great. I feel really, really good. I feel energetic. Uh, I feel more peaceful and calm about my life, but at the same time, very enthusiastic. I've even started writing my book. Fantastic. A couple of chapters. Okay, thank you very much. So she is working on a book about what it's like to come back from having early dementia. Um, this is another guy I wanted to show you. Um, very typical story. He's ApoE4 positive, and about 60 to 65 percent of all patients with ApoE4, uh, or, or of all patients with Alzheimer's, are ApoE4 positive. Uh, and 75 million Americans actually are ApoE4 positive, so they are at risk. If you have zero copies of ApoE4, um, you have about a 9% chance throughout your lifetime of developing Alzheimer's disease. If you have a single copy, you have about a 30% chance during your lifetime. And if you have two copies, if you're homozygous, you have a, somewhere around a 90% chance of developing Alzheimer's disease. So the idea, obviously, is to identify all these people and prevent all of them. And that, that's the future. Um, that's hopefully where we're headed right now. So this person had one copy. Um, and had a, a PET scan, very typical for Alzheimer's disease, with temporoparietal reduction in glucose utilization. Um, he had neuropsych testing uh, in 2003, 2007, and 2013, and you could see he just fell right off the curve. And what many people do, he went through a period where he declined slowly, and then he had an accelerated decline, which again, very positive, and was really accelerating, and as I'll, I'll show you some of his scores, over the previous 18 months. And so his wife heard about what we were doing and brought him to me in December of 2013. You can see here he had progressive loss. Um, his California verbal learning test, which is very typically abnormal in, in Alzheimer's disease, had gone from 84th percentile early on down to one percentile. So this guy really had very little memory left. And he did what many people do. Um, he would get extra assistance that would say, you have to go here, you have to do this, you have to do that. But he had major, major problems in his daily life. Um, unable to remember locker combination, faces, schedule, and all sorts of difficulties in work. Interestingly, throughout his life, he'd been one of these people who could look at a column of numbers and very quickly come up with a, an answer of the sum of all the numbers. So he would meet with his accountants, and he's got offices on East Coast and West Coast, and he'd say, oh, this is about 420,000, and they'd say, yeah, it's very close. He lost that with his Alzheimer's. He got it back on this program, and he still has it. Um, so he really had, he had passed SCI, what we call subjective cognitive impairment, and MCI, and really was at the early stages of Alzheimer's. And interestingly, he, it took about six months uh, for him to improve. Um, he recognized his coworkers, schedule, faces, but his wife called me up and she said, you know, you missed the most important thing. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said he had really been accelerating for the 18 months before coming in, and that really completely stopped when he got on the program, and then he started, after several months, started to improve. So, of course, the question was, you know, is this just all in his mind? Um, I presented this to the Buck Institute scientists a few weeks ago, and one of them said, well, maybe just talking to him, it made him feel better. So we had him come back, um, and I'll show you his scores. They're very striking. So he talks a little bit about his story here. And went to open the locker at my gym, and I could not remember the combination, which is, in, uh, as I know myself, that'd be very unusual. And I would meet with my accountant, say, and we would just toss out some numbers, and I would have the number faster that he'd get to his computer usually. So things like that started to wane uh, dramatically. Clearly, I mean, the, the math has come back. That's a real measurable thing. I mean, I'm fast with math again. People I had met, maybe even taken to lunch, 
I did not know who they were. I mean, it's like a new new encounter. And then afterwards, they'd say, uh, you actually know this person. So that's caught away, which is a relief. So we sent him back to the same neuropsychologist, and who was very skeptical, by the way, who'd done 2003, 2007, 2013. And you can see his 2013 scores here were just horrible. I mean, you know, third percentile here, less than one, uh, 13th percentile here, 24th percentile. And he was reluctant. It's, it's been very interesting to see how both the doctors and the patients respond to changes in their cognition because we all hear on TV and radio every day, you can't treat this, it's horrible, there's nothing you can do. And so we sent this guy back and he said, look, I really don't want to go back because the neuropsychologist last time I saw him in 2013 told me to get my affairs in order because I had Alzheimer's and there was nothing to be done. And he said, this guy's you know, pretty negative. And we said, look, just go, do the best you can, let's, let's see how things go. So I got a call from the neuropsychologist he said, I've been practicing for 30 years. I've never seen anything like this before. So here you can see he went from third percentile here to 84th percentile, three standard deviation change. Here from less than one to 50, you can see here 54 to 96, 13th percentile to 79th. So when this guy said on here, my math is, has come back, he wasn't kidding, it really has come back. And what's been interesting is these initial patients where we're looking at objective improvements, the objective improvements have been at least as striking as their subjective improvements. The exciting thing initially was that they were going back to work and they were able to deal with things at work. And the coworkers said, oh my gosh, yeah, it's so obvious. And the spouses said, it's so obvious. And the patients said, it's so obvious. But of course, everyone asked, is this just a, is this just a placebo effect? Well, you know, these are striking effects here, you can see. And what was interesting to me was that the neuropsychologist said, well, I'm most excited about the processing speed. And I said, why? I mean, that's the one thing he did well on before. He said, yeah, but he actually went up. He said, number one, this is the thing that limits people with traumatic brain injury. And number two, it's the thing that limits people as they age who don't have Alzheimer's disease, is that their processing speed tends to slow down. He said, in fact, we actually use this as a me measure of age. So this guy's actually getting a younger brain here. And so he said, whatever you're doing, it seems to be making his brain younger. So this guy's now sending you know, more and more people our way for this. And here's another person. And this person now is APOE44 here. You can see a homozygote. And of course, in general, the APOE4 patients are the ones that have responded the least or the most poorly, often with side effects, to some of the drug trials. So to see people improving is really exciting and wonderful. Here, this person here you can see 2015 and actually increased here again. Every test did you know, much improved here. Um, and this was now for f five months on what we call MEND, which is metabolic enhancement for neurodegeneration, which is really a functional medicine approach, asking what is the underlying biology and how we can correct that. We had another woman recently who went to a major university in New York, um, lives in New York, uh, and her father had uh, severe Alzheimer's disease. She herself knew that she was APOE4 positive. She had early symptoms. So she went into the university and said, I would like to get on your prevention program. And so they tested her, again, just like this, and said, well, you can't get on the prevention program because you already have it. You already have the symptoms. This was now in February of 2015. She went on this MEND program, and then she went back in November. And November, they said, what have you been doing? I mean, you're, you're normal. You're back to normal. And she had written over the summer and talking about all the things that, that had improved for her. So we're seeing this sort of thing repeatedly now. Here's another person. This is actually a, an internal medicine physician uh, who both, both his parents had died with dementia. And so when he was in his early 60s, and he's now 66, when he was in his early 60s, he began to have senior moments, as he called them. And so he then went and got himself checked out. And very quickly, unfortunately, he found out that he had all these symptoms and signs. He had a positive amyloid scan. He had a, a abnormal PET scan, classic for Alzheimer's disease. His hippocampal volume had he'd atrophied down to 17th percentile, um, and his uh, neuropsych uh, testing was abnormal. You can see here, again, these are just a few of the many, many things we look at. And again, these are very typical for functional medicine evaluations. His fasting insulin, which as Mark points out, should be down around four or so or below, was 32. So this guy really had a very typical sort of profile for someone who's headed for what Mark calls diabetes. Um, and so here is HSCRP 9.9, .9, homocysteine was 15. And interestingly, vitamin D3, this is a physician, he's walking around with a vitamin D of 21. 
And he was struggling at work. There was no question, very significant issues. And you can see, this was reflected in his scan. So his MRI hippocampal volume, 17th percentile. So we went on, interestingly, he was on this for 10 months, and it was a struggle because this guy is a brilliant doctor. He'd gone to a major university when he was 15 years old because he was a genius. He was always the smartest guy in the room. So of course, everything I would tell him, he would argue with me. He'd say, oh, that's compliment, that's alternative medicine. I'm not, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. He'd say, you know, just humor me, do this for a few months. About three months into this, his wife called me and said, wow, you know, he is really better. Interestingly, he got to about five months and he said, I don't want to do this stuff. It's too complicated. I don't want to do these different things. It's bothering me. Uh, and so he went off. And after about two weeks off, it turned out he, his wife came home. The car was in the driveway with the keys in the ignition running. And he was in the house working. Had, didn't realize that the car was out there running. So he, he realized, okay, this was working for me. He went back on it. So at 10 months, I asked him, let's get you another, let's get you a follow-up MRI with hippocampal volume. And you can see, and of course, he said to me, Brains don't grow. It's not going to get any bigger. And I said, well, this is a, you know, an area of the brain where it's relatively plastic. And in fact, exercise alone has been shown to have very modest in increases in size and hippocampal volume. Let's see where you stand. So he went in here, went from 17th percentile to 75th percentile. Now in this one, the neuroradiologist called and said, we've made a mistake. And I said, well, what do you mean a mistake? He said, well, this can't happen. He said, Some, you know, something's wrong with our machine. So I said, well, wait, no, this guy's, this guy's doing much better. And you know, there have been small in improvements with just exercise alone. So why wouldn't you think that this is correct? He said, because this can't happen. This, this sort of increase in hippocampal volume, he said, we've done 75,000 scans at this hospital. We've never seen this before. So I went and got the scans. We took them to a separate independent group that read them. And they said, actually, this is a little bit of an underestimate. This guy was a little lower than the 17th, and he's actually a little higher than the 75th. But it's interesting to see how people will try to put them together. In fact, he actually suggested, he said, I think he was probably more like 35 both times. Well, you know, he just didn't want to believe that, in fact, these things happen. People do get larger hippocampi when they do the right things. This gets at the heart of what's actually causing the illness. So I should mention before I move on here, the phagocytosis index, because this has been very interesting, it's a way to follow these people in real time. So Dr. Milan Fiala at UCLA, who's a neuroimmunologist, invented a test. He published this back in 2008. It got paper of the year for journal Alzheimer's disease. And what he showed is that you can actually look at the ability of peripheral blood mononuclear cells to phagocytose A beta. So he just takes a blood test, boom, throws on some A beta, and then says, how much can he phagocytose? And what he finds is people with Alzheimer's are very poor phagocytosers of A beta, typically below his cutoff is 500. And people who, who are normal are above 500. And indeed, everybody on this program is up 1,100, 1,200. We've had them as high as 3,000. And we had one of the patients who came in and was going along at 1,200 on the program, went off the program for a couple of weeks, came in again and was at 200. So it changes your ability to phagocytose the A beta. And then went back on it, went back up to 1,100. So it's a nice way to look at this in real time. You know, we tend to look at this only with monotonic declines, but we're beginning to be able now to see the metabolic changes that are underlying this problem. So I'll spend just a couple minutes talking about why we did what we did for these people. A little historical background. So uh, when I was an 18-year-old uh, college freshman at Caltech, I read this book called The Machinery of the Brain by Dean Wold Wooldridge of TRW fame, and I was hooked for life on what does the brain do? It's such a fascinating organ. How does it work? And it was a great time to be there because I learned from Dr. Max Delbrook, who's the father of molecular biology, Seymour Benzer, who is the father of molecular genetics and behavioral genetics, really. Of course, Roger Sperry, who won the Nobel Prize for his split brain work. Uh, James Olds was there, um, who is, was the one who discovered pleasure centers of the brain. And then later, I was a postdoctoral fellow with Dr. Stanley Prusner, who won the Nobel Prize in 1997 for discovery of prions. And now, as he's showing, in fact, Prions are related to many neurodegenerative diseases, not just what was originally called prion diseases. And then Mark Wrighton, who's now the chancellor at WashU, and I worked for Mark when he was a 22-year-old graduate student at Caltech, uh, and he did energy transfer chemistry, uh, and then worked for him when he went on to MIT. So I was extremely fortunate, and it's just been uh, fantastic to hear these wonderful people talking about um, their exciting research and to learn from them. 
So the idea when we set up the lab was we wanted to study the fundamental mechanisms of neurodegeneration. And I was really envious of the oncology researchers but because they had these great ways they can throw cells in a dish from a tumor and say, ah, this is going to be invasive, this is going to be non-invasive, this is going to have this characteristic, that characteristic. Great. There was no such thing when we started out back in the late 80s. There was no such way to study neurodegeneration. So you really couldn't do all these nice tests with transfections and analyses of the cells. So we wanted to figure out a way to study cells in a dish that would give us a look into neurodegeneration. And so in, when we set this up, we looked, and one of the first things we found was that, in fact, when you transfect any gene that's associated with neurodegeneration into neural cells that you're culturing in a dish, the probability that they will commit suicide goes up. So it was a great first way to look at, okay, here's a gene that actually has something to do with neurodegeneration. Then we could study, okay, what makes that better? How does that work? What's causing this to induce this programmed cell death? And we discovered something called dependence receptors. And we found these are things that actually induce the death of cells when they don't get their appropriate trophic support. So for example, P75 is a molecule where NGF binds to it. You pull away the NGF and the, and the uh, P75 and the track A that, that bind to the NGF will kill the cell. So it's, we call these dependence receptors because they created states of dependence on their re, uh, respective ligands. And what we found that was really interesting was after we discovered these dependence receptors, and this was back in 1993, and this was um, on the front page of USA Today, and it was in a number of papers around the world, and uh, people said, oh, well, you know, this is going to have something to do with Alzheimer's. Well, we didn't know that back then. But what we found, interestingly, is that APP, the amyloid precursor protein that sits at the heart of Alzheimer's disease, turns out to be one of these receptors. So in fact, it gave us a clue about what this disease is actually about. And so we created a mouse, the D664A mouse, where we you could make one little mutation and change that ability to induce programmed cell death. And in fact, the mouse resists Alzheimer's disease beautifully. So this really gave us a look into what Alzheimer's disease is all about. And what we realized is that there is a ratio, there's literally a balance, a plasticity balance that there's a heart of this. This allowed us to screen for drugs. So we looked for drugs that change this balance. And by the way, that we looked for things that we call dementogens, because as you know, Bruce Ames has taught us all how to look for carcinogens, but nobody tells you how to look for dementogens. What if there are things that you're eating or spraying your hair with, et cetera, that are actually increasing your likelihood of getting dementia? Well, in all likelihood, there are. And the first thing that came out of screening all the drugs that have been approved was that statins will actually cause this, and we published this a few years ago, actually, that statins one of the, are one of the things that change this critical ratio in APP processing. We then looked for drugs that put you on the right side of that processing, and we discover one called FO3, and this is the one that's now in clinical trial in Australia. So if you look at the results from genetics, from cell biology, from biochemistry, from epidemiology, imaging, and clinical trials, the good news is that these things all help each other. They're, they're literally orthogonal. That is to say, you can find things from genetics that will tell you certain things about Alzheimer's, but it doesn't answer other questions. But now, if you put these up against what you're learning from cell biology, and sometimes, for example, from epidemiology, you'll find things that will be very hard to find from some of these others. So when you put all these different findings together, what you find is there's tremendous constraint. There have been over 50,000 papers published on Alzheimer's disease so far. So therefore, you can reject the vast majority of hypotheses about these diseases just by looking at the 50,000 papers that have already, 50,000 plus, that have already been published. So that really gives us a leg up. We can say, okay, look, if we have an idea that fits with all the things here, then maybe we're on the right track and maybe we should push this farther. And so that's how we ended up with this idea of metabolic enhancement for neurodegeneration based on the fundamental biology that happens in Alzheimer's disease. So let me summarize the results from the last 27 years in the lab. So here are the, here are this, uh, here are the findings, and um, some of these will be, uh, for, for people who are in the field, um, may be a bit controversial. So some of the things we found uh, don't go along the lines um, that we generally hear at Alzheimer's meetings. So what we found is that what is referred to as Alzheimer's disease 
is actually a protective response to several metabolic and toxic insults. So when you look at amyloid, organisms make amyloid for three reasons. They make it because of infection or inflammation. So it's a, it's a very good, for example, um, amyloid, if you look at A-beta, what it actually is, it's a very good endogenous anti-biofilm. If you want to treat a biofilm, you use EDTA and you use antib antibiotics. What is A-beta? It, it binds metals like EDTA and then it has an antibiotic effect, as Rudy Tanzi showed a number of years ago. So it's a great endogenous antibiofilm. Second reason organisms make amyloid is because of trophic withdrawal. And so Catania from Italy showed a number of years ago that if you simply take neurons and you withdraw their NGF, they start making amyloid. So it's part of a downsizing, a programmatic downsizing that occurs. And the third reason that organisms make amyloid is to bind toxins. So if you challenge bacteria, for example, with mercury, what do they do? They make amyloid. Um, amyloid binds a number of different toxins. So this is actually a protective response. And so great idea to remove the amyloid after you've removed what's inducing the amyloid. But the idea of removing the amyloid without, in, without removing what's inducing the amyloid actually makes no fundamental biological sense. Second thing is, when you do a functional medicine evaluation on people, when you do significant metabolic profiling, which typically isn't done with Alzheimer's patients, you immediately see that there are several different types. They fall into different groups. And for many people, Alzheimer's disease is actually not a disease. It's a programmatic downsizing of the neuroplasticity network. So literally, you're downsizing. You're, what you're doing is you're, you're looking at a match. And I'll show you how the biochemistry of this in just a moment. That's how this works. So Alzheimer's disease is not a mysterious, untreatable brain disease. It's a reversible, metabolic and toxic, usually systemic illness with a relatively large window for treatment. You have about 10 years of SCI on average. This, this is the subjective cognitive impairment where you're still scoring in the normal range, even though you may be low in the normal range, you're still in the normal range. Then you proceed to mild cognitive impairment, which usually lasts a few years. And then you finally get full-blown Alzheimer's disease. So if we could get people to come in at the very beginning, we could do a tremendous amount for them. With respect to treatment of Alzheimer's disease, drugs are critical. Sure, they're important, but they're not the, they're, they're the dessert. They're, they're not the entree, okay? They're not the main thing. You want to do, what we'd really like to see is, let's test all of our drugs on the background of functional medicine. Now we have a much better chance of addressing all of the things that are leading to the problem. The next thing, we just published a paper recently showing there may be 500,000 Americans, there's certainly a large number, who have what we call inhalational Alzheimer's disease, IAD. And these are people who actually fit into Dr. Richie Shoemaker's uh, definition of SIRS, Chronic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. These people have, surprisingly, the laboratory values associated with SIRS. And then finally, for optimal responses, monotherapeutics should be replaced by programmatics. The idea is you want to have a program, you want to have a personalized program. So let me just spend the next couple of minutes then talking about why these neurons degenerate. So if you look at neurons, you go to the most basic science and ask what actually goes wrong in this illness, then if you want to make an organism, you have to have three basic processes, right? You have to have proliferation, you have to have differentiation, the second migration, and then you have to have integration. So you've got to have all these things to make an organism. Now, if you are a lower organism, like a C. elegans, like a nematode, for example, once these developmental processes happen, you're done. You're going to live about three weeks, and that's it. But if you're a higher species, like a human being, you get to use these same processes for repair and regeneration. So you get to live, theoretically, 100 years or even more instead of a couple of weeks. But in so doing, you set up a lifelong requirement for balance in these processes. And this is absolutely critical. And we're all used to hearing about this one when the proliferation balance is out of whack. So you have oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. You go out and you smoke too much or get exposed to chemical carcinogens, etc. You can have an imbalance here. And this becomes a disease because it has positive feedback, because the cells that are abnormal actually have a Darwinian advantage over the ones that are normal. And nobody ever talks about the analogy with these processes, but what we found is that the same thing applies. And the thing is, there has been no way until recently to amplify the effect the way there is in cancer. 
But now what's turned out is with the discovery of prions, we can now see how this process can be amplified. So there's a whole set of proteins involved in synaptic reorganization and synaptic maintenance. Literally, this is the remembering side, this is the forgetting side, but much like in cancer, when you have an imbalance here, you actually have this, this amplification. In this case, the amplification is not at the cellular level, but it's at the protein level. So literally, what this means is Alzheimer's disease is a molecular cancer. It is a, an amplifying phenomenon that, where the amplification occurs at the biochemical level, not at the cellular level. But in other respects, it is very analogous to cancer. Okay, so we just want to know all the processes here and here. We want to rebalance this. That's the way we go after this. So the idea is that these chronic illnesses that we're all dealing with are signaling imbalances. So osteoblastic activity is outstripped chronically by osteoclastic activity when you have osteoporosis. In cancer, cytoblastic activity outstrips the cytoclastic activity. And what we found is Alzheimer's is no different. The signals involved in synaptoblastic activity are outstripped chronically by those involved in synaptoclastic activity. Okay, so we just want to map all those signals and we want to understand what's causing them. So here's one synapse and you have about 10 to the 15th. You have one quadrillion of these synapses in your brain. And what we found again, very much like with uh, osteoporosis, where you've got the positive side here, you've got the negative, this is the synaptoblastic side, synaptoclastic. Everybody with Alzheimer's and pre-Alzheimer's has this too long and this too short. Well, we can now measure these various things, and with the exosomes as I, measure, as I mentioned, it's gonna be better and better. And we can look at what's actually wrong. And if you now blow this up, you actually have molecules you can look at. So here's amyloid precursor protein, and you've got both the trophic anti-Alzheimer's side, and then you've got the anti-trophic pro-Alzheimer's side. And so what happens is, APP turns out to be just like the CFO of your company. APP is literally looking at dozens and dozens of inputs, just as a CFO would be looking at the various accountant reports and saying, okay, can we afford to add new synapses? Do we have all the appropriate inputs? Now, if all the appropriate things are there, the CFO sends out two memos. It gets cleaved here and it sends out this memo for the public and this memo for internal to the company. These things, SAPP alpha and CTF alpha are peptides. And it says, okay, we can add new things. And for most of your life, you've got a beautiful balance. This is the forgetting side. Unfortunately, if you now are chronically in a state where you're not supporting, just again, just like your company, then it sends out four memos. It's cleaved here, here, and here. And these two memos, again, are for the public. These two are for internal consumption here. And they say, okay, we have to downsize. And again, no different than your company, what's the first thing that goes? adding new employees, and that's exactly what happens here. So you undergo a downsizing, and again, the common thing that people say is, I was at dinner last night with my wife or husband, and he or she asked me the same question three times. So it's, and they, they can still drive, they can still play tennis, they can still do math, they can still read, they can still speak, they have all the other things that have been less plastic. And again, if you look at why the brain would programmatically downsize this way, well, would you rather forget how to drive or speak or do your work, or would you rather forget the Friends rerun that played last night on TV? For most of us, we'd rather forget the Friends rerun, and that's exactly what your brain is doing. So this is really the canary in the mine when people can't add new memories. And that's a time when you can change things dramatically by altering that. And all the things that we associate with Alzheimer's disease are downstream. This is why we looked at this 4-2 ratio. Here are what we call the four bad guys, the two good guys. So we measure the ratio of these and we look for therapeutics that change that ratio. Now if we ask, okay, in a human being, what are all the things that contribute to this ratio? It turns out to be a lot, you can see here. So in fact, all the things that we think about in functional medicine, your estradiol level contributes directly to this. Estradiol turns on genes that cleave APP. If you take the estradiol away, you lose the good side cleavage and you gain the bad side cleavage. Testosterone, vitamin D, your HSCRP, NF-kappa B, all fit directly. They feed directly into this connectome. And so we can look at the things that are actually driving the underlying process. Sure, we see it pathologically as having A, beta, and tau, but this is what's actually driving the pathology here. So that's what we want to understand. So what I always tell the patients is, imagine a roof with 36 holes in it. 
A drug is going to be a tremendous way to plug one hole, but and maybe it's going to work really well. And in fact, it should work much better if you plug the other holes with functional medicine approaches. So you want to plug all 36 holes. The good news is, because of this phenomenon, this prionic loop phenomenon that I'll show you in a second here, once you get over the threshold, again, just like uh, what, what Dean Ornish has done with atherosclerosis, once you get over the threshold, now you start picking up the plaque, and just like here, you start getting better. So the first woman I showed you actually only did 12 out of the 36 things, but for her, that was enough. So the last few minutes, I want to talk about APOE4 because it is such a critical issue. As I mentioned, it's about 60 to 65 percent of all Alzheimer's patients. It's been clear that it is the major genetic risk factor. And the hope in the future is that nobody with APOE4 will ever have to worry about Alzheimer's disease again because we will identify people early, get them on the right program, and prevent this problem. But the big problem until recently has been how does it actually confer this risk for Alzheimer's. It's supposed to be literally a fat bucket, a molecule that carries around lipid. And so the question is, how do you start with APOE4 and you end up with Alzheimer's? That is the canonical case for about 60 to 65 percent of people who have Alzheimer's. There's a big black box in the middle. So seven years ago, we started a project to ask what is in that black box. And the first thing we wanted to know is, does it change that 4-2 ratio that we looked at? And it absolutely does. It changes it beautifully. And in fact, if you look here, APOE is an extremely interesting molecule. It has to do with evolution, with longevity. People with APOE4 uh, have had shorter, on average, lifespans. And again, we'd like to change that. Alzheimer's disease um, in increases also in cardiovascular disease, increases in inflammation, major problem. And if you look at our common ancestors for the chimps and the humans, what happened is there were a finite number of mutations that occurred that led to humans. And in fact, they surprisingly, a large number of them have to do with inflammation. Why would that be? Why do humans have to be more pro-inflammatory? So God came down here and touched our common ancestors with DNA and made a finite number of mutations that allowed us to think better and do things that we could never do before. And if you look at throughout human history, we have all been APOE4 homozygotes throughout 96% of human history. And it's only in the last 220,000 years ago that APOE3 has appeared, which is now the dominant one. And APOE2 just appeared about 80,000 years ago. So for all this time, APOE4 was the, dom was the only uh, uh, allele for humans. And the argument that's been made is, for us to come down out of the trees, for us to walk the savanna, what did we need? Well, we would step on dung, we would get infections, we would eat meat with microbes, raw meat. We would fight with each other. We would go long periods without having food. APOE4 helps you with all those things. It helps you to be able to have a pro-inflammatory state. How the heck does that work if it's just a fat bucket? So if you look at APOE4 versus APOE3, you say something very interesting. They're structurally very different. APOE3 looks like a nutcracker. APOE4 looks like columns, and it's because of this arginine 61, and in a, in a chimp, this is threonine. So when you mutated to arginine 61 with, with the appearance of the hominids, it interacted with this glutamate 255 and basically pulled these together. So you have this structure that looks like columns. Well, then there was a second mutation that occurred only 220,000 years ago where this cysteine 112 appeared from the arginine. And in fact, this now interacts with the arginine. And so now the glutamate is out here by itself. So you change fundamentally the structure of this. And what we found is something really striking. APOE4 binds to its many different receptors, but the surprise is it doesn't, it's not just a fat bucket. It goes inside the cell, it interacts with a molecule called REL-A, which is part of NF-kappa B, it enters the nucleus, and it binds to the promoters of 1,700 different genes. So this is like finding out that your butcher is also a senator because you've got something that was just supposed to be a fat bucket, right? Now it turns out it's setting, it's setting the laws for the whole, the whole country, right? So it's telling 1,700 genes what to do. So this is really striking. We just published this a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, actually. This was the work of Ram Rao and Veena Thindakara in the laboratory. Very excited about that. So if you then ask, what are these 1,700 genes where it binds to their promoters? It is literally the story of Alzheimer's disease. 
So it's inflammation-related things, NF-kappa B, very strikingly, neurotrophins, programmed cell death, all of these sorts of things. So what we want to do then is to create the 21st century physician, right? So the 20... The 20th century and physicians, they understood things like DNA and RNA and protein. And of course, the ancient, the traditional Chinese doctors understood working with the whole body. We want to create people who can do both of those. And so that's what functional medicine is all about. It's questioning the way we've always done things. Functional medicine is iconoclastic. And iconoclasts are history's wormholes through which impossible advances are realized. And that's what's going on in functional medicine. You look at what are the exciting things happening, the things that Mark Hyman is doing, the things that David Perlmutter is doing, the things that David Jones is doing. The functional medicine physicians are changing the world. This is really exciting. And it's the way to deal with chronic illness. So this group here is gonna change the world. So I'm gonna finish up then just a moment here because I realize the time is late. Um, I'll go through a little bit of the protocol because there's not time to go through everything. Um, we are setting up and I'm working with David Jones to set up uh, courses so we would train practitioners um, on uh, how to do this to so look at all the different uh, biochemistry and genetics that underlies the problem. So the basic idea here is we've mapped many different molecular mechanisms of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's onto a treatment protocol. There's something you can do about every single one of these things that you saw on the connectome. These include dozens of different interventions, and of course, they begin with diet, exercise, stress, and sleep. And, and my wife uh, is a family practice physician. She told me 25 years ago, whatever you come up with Alzheimer's in your research, it's gonna have something to do with diet, exercise, stress, sleep. And I said, no, no, we're gonna find you know, one little molecule here that's gonna be one specific fold on one thing. Well, I should have listened to her 25 years ago. So yeah, I would have been way ahead of the, the game. So it also includes hormonal optimization, nutrients, targeted herbs, brain stimulation, drugs. Basically, there are many, many different ways to get at the biochemistry of what's going on in the brain. And it's very much of a functional medicine approach. And of course, no one intervention closes all 36 holes. People say to me, well, wait a minute, that, you know, that's not an Alzheimer's cure. Yeah, not by itself. But you want, to, you, don't, you want to not leave these things out. So the approach is pull out all the stops. And a couple things on the basic concepts, we want to identify all the contributors to the imbalanced plasticity. Now we know what to look for. Now we can see what's playing into this. So we want to know your plasticity ratio. You know, we want to know all the network from all, more than 60 different things that we look at. We want to know your copper zinc ratio. We want to know your red blood cell magnesium. We want to know your HSCRP, homocysteine, fancy insulin, you know, on and on and on and on and on. And more and more things. We want to know your TGF beta one. We want to know your C4A. We want to know your MSH. And then what's interesting is we can then say to you, okay, you've got, well, do you have type 1, type 1 1.5, type 2, type 3, type 4, type 5? We can tell you what you have, and we have an algorithm that will calculate for you what percentage of each of these in the contributors do you have. And then we can go after those things specifically. And so for each abnormality, we want to be, go beyond simply normalizing. This is one of the things that... that as physicians, we've always been taught, well, if it's within normal limits, that's fine. But again, that's not fine for this. When you've got a chronic illness, you don't want to have, you don't want to walk around with a vitamin B12 of 350. You want to be above 500. You want to be optimized for each of these things. We want to address as many of the abnormalities as possible, not just one. And for each treatment, the goal is to design the treatment so it'll be as physiological and as upstream and as possible. And so because the time's late here, I'm going to run to the to the end here because I want to make a couple final comments here. Um, and so let's, here we go. Let's go here. And okay, so what do we need to bring together the basic biochemistry and genetics to make it so that these are really helpful to functional medicine? We need larger data sets. We need to allow subtyping of these various chronic illnesses. We need personalized programmatics. We need people to come in sooner who have any sort of cognitive changes. The earlier, the better. We need to start prevention or early reversal. We need major projects to identify people at risk. For example, the 75 million E4 heterozygotes and the 7 million homozygotes. We'd like to see it so that none ever develop Alzheimer's disease. And we need functional medicine courses in medical schools and residencies. Uh, I went back to my alma mater a few years ago and went to the the center, and it was essentially a, you know, an alternative medicine center where they, were, they had candles burning and things like that. And they didn't really kind of get that this is about science and, and, and taking this to, 
to medicine. So to finish, we'll come back to Sir Isaac Newton again. He said, we build too many walls and not enough bridges. And the fact of the matter is we need to build bridges from functional medicine to cardiology to internal medicine to neurology to, to every area of specialty. And the Cleveland Clinic has been fantastic because it's taken the first steps in building a bridge to the future. So thanks once again to the Cleveland Clinic and to Mark for the uh, in invitation here. And congratulations once again on this Functional Medicine Center. What a fabulous idea and you will forever be first. So congratulations. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Um, Next uh, November, this November 4th, we're having a, a case-based approach on exploring functional medicine, a whole day seminar. Now also our next Grand Rounds is June 7th with Dr. David Ludwig from Harvard talking about metabolism uh, and uh, the fact that all calories are not the same. Uh, I think we, we really had our horizons expanded uh, trying to understand the dementia not as a singular disease but as uh, perhaps 36 or 136 different phenomena that are all intersecting with the brain causing a metabolic encephalopathy and asking the question why and looking at the body and the brain as a complex adaptive system and the Alzheimer's as a systemic disorder not a brain disorder is really I think a critical and I think a radical step in, in rethinking our, our view of Alzheimer's so I really appreciate Dr. Bredesen's work and uh, look forward to more collaboration engagement. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>